Good afternoon. Welcome to another daily devotion. It's great to be together. Wonderful to be able to pause in the afternoon and just open up God's word again. I'm going to be turning through to Matthew chapter 22 for the last time, looking at the final section there. But before we turn to that, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word which you have given us, your word, which is rich and true. We pray that you would bless it to us, that we might feed upon you, and that we might celebrate your goodness, and that we might understand Jesus more. Would your spirit please work in us, so that we might understand what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turning through to Matthew chapter 22, reading verse 41 through to 46. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Whose son is the Christ is the title the ESV gives this section. And it raises a couple of really important questions. And in order to understand what's happening here, you do need to put it in its context. If you travel back with me through to chapter 20 at the end there, you remember there's that section where Jesus heals two blind men. And they say of Jesus, have a look at verse 30, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And then they cry out again in verse 31, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Then, when you get to chapter 21, as Jesus is coming into the town, he is hailed in verse 9 as Hosanna to the son of David. And in verse 11, the crowd say, sorry, in verse 10, the whole city asks, who is this? And it raises the question, what is Jesus? If, he, if he's the son of David, what does that mean? We remember several times we've seen Jesus correcting expectations about what he is to be, who he is to be, what sort of mission as a Messiah, what does that look like? And here in this section, there's, there's two things going on. On the face value, Jesus is challenging the Pharisees. But there's something far deeper going on. And so in, in one aspect, he's just challenging the Pharisees. They've finished berating him with questions. They've been trying to trap him. They've been trying to wrestle with him. And then in verse 41 onwards, Jesus flips the tables. And Jesus comes and asks them the question and confounds them. He leaves them stuck, we're told, by the end of the section, verse 46. No one is able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Now, what is it about this question of Jesus that silences everybody? Is it just that he's really clever and his question confounds them so much that they think it's not worth debating with him because he's too clever for us? I think in one aspect you can say yes, in a simplistic sense that's true, but there's a far deeper reason why no one would dare challenge his authority after this point. It's not that no one asks him another questions, because when he's interrogated, he gets asked a whole bunch of questions. But, but no one dares challenge his authority and what he says about himself from this point forward. Why? What is, a, what is it about this section, about the son of David that does that? Well, Jesus asks him, what do you think about the Christ whose son he is? Is he? Sorry, not he is. Is he? Poor grammar. And the Pharisees rightly say he's the son of David. And that was, of course, the Old Testament prophecy, wasn't it? The son of David. Because David had been promised that he would have a son who would sit upon his throne. 
there would be a king that would come after him who would rule. And, and all of the Old Testament prophecies pointed in that direction. So everyone knew that the Messiah of God who would come would be the son of David. Now, Jesus comes and he says to them, if that's the case, if the Messiah is the son of David, then how come David calls him Lord? And he, and he references Psalm 110. That's where this section, if you've got a, I think probably most modern translations have it indented and it looks like a piece of poetry that sits out by itself. Psalm 110 verse 1, he quotes that, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So David, inspired by the Spirit of God, writes this psalm in which he calls the Messiah, who is going to be a son, he calls the Messiah his Lord. Why is that important? Why does that have a bearing on the question of who Jesus is as the Messiah and what that means? Jesus says, how is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord? Verse 45, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? What is Jesus challenging here? <clears throat> Jesus is challenging the idea that the Messiah would simply be another David. He's challenging the concept that was rife throughout that time period, that the, the new Messiah that would come, or I should say not the new, the Messiah that would come, the anointed one, would come and take up the mantle of David and follow the expectations of King David and fulfill that same role. And what Jesus is showing is that nothing is further from the truth. Why? Well, the son follows after the father's footsteps. We know that. That's just part of normal life. But what Jesus is pointing out is that the Messiah doesn't come under David, in other words, under David's authority, to fulfill the expectations of a Davidic king. No, the Messiah comes as the Lord of David. In other words, David did what he did because the Lord told him. Because the Messiah told him. He fulfilled his office and the Messiah as Lord doesn't come to submit to David and fulfill the same type of office, office as David. He comes under a far greater authority. So now remember, everyone's calling Jesus what? The son of David. And so the expectation of everybody would be that he would come and take up the throne and get rid of Rome and fulfill this fancy fancy Davidic office. And what Jesus is pointing out is that he doesn't come under the authority of David. He doesn't come under the authority of a man, but of course he comes with the authority of God. And of course, what's the implied logical answer to what Jesus is saying? What's the challenge that Jesus is saying? He's saying, if I am the son of David, as everyone's calling me, then I don't come just as the son of David, but I come as Lord. And therefore, I, therefore, I don't come with the authority of David, but I come with the authority of God. Now, obviously, that, that leaves them in a very awkward position, doesn't it? And if you think back to that challenge Jesus gave them about John the Baptist, you remember whose authority did John baptize people under? Was it the authority of God or did he baptize by man? And they didn't answer him because it would trap them. Well, there's a similar sense here. You see, if they say, you're not the son of David, then they've got the whole group of people around them to deal with. But if they say you are the son of David, they can't then deny that he is not the Lord and Messiah. Jesus is not just claiming to be in the lineage of David. He's claiming to be the Lord. There's people that say that Jesus was just a great teacher. Jesus never had these types of ideas. It was never in the mind of Jesus. But it's nonsense. Jesus himself claims the full authority of Yahweh. If you don't want to believe in Jesus, it's not whether it's not about at the end of the day whether you believe in the man and the message. It's whether you'll believe God. 
Because God himself is claiming here, or let me say it differently, Jesus is claiming here that he is God, Lord of all creation, Lord of all that has ever been. And so as C.S. Lewis famously put it, Jesus is either a liar, a madman, or he's the Lord. There's no in-between. So he's either lying and he's not the son of David and he's not the Messiah. He's either insane and he's claiming things which no one can claim. Or he truly is the Lord. But the wonderful thing about the fact that he's the Lord is that that means he gets to define his own messiahship. You see, if he's just a son of David, then he has to fulfill purely the Davidic expectations that everybody was expecting. But if he's the Lord, or let me say, since he's the Lord, he can define, he defines what his role as Messiah is. And so as we head towards the cross, we get that joy of knowing that his, his work as a Messiah is not a failure. When Jesus dies on the cross, it's not a, a mistake, a blunder. It's not a accident in the plan of God that his son, the Messiah, dies. You see, some people would say, see, the evidence of the rejection of Jesus is the evidence that he wasn't the Messiah because the true Messiah would be welcomed by the people. And yet what we see here is actually quite the opposite. Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus gets to define his work as the Messiah. And so Jesus heads to the cross because that is his definitive plan. The plan set up by the Godhead in order to save humanity. So there's a reason that no one dared challenge his authority after this. It's because... His authority was not man-derived, but God-derived. And so we're going we're to segue from this next week into the, into the seven woes, if you have a look at the title of chapter 23, the seven woes to the Pharisees. Why? Because in spite of all of their teaching, all of their understanding, all of their Old Testament history, in spite of everything they had been given, they refused to come to the Messiah. And it's a challenge for you and I. Will we come to the Messiah? Not on our terms, not on the terms of any church, not on the terms of any humanistic understanding of the Messiah, but purely on the authority of what Christ says. You know, and the wonderful thing about this is it fills us with a great sense of assurance and hope. You see, when Jesus promises that all who come to me will not be cast away, he does that with the authority of the Lord. He does that in the full authority of God. You see, he's not just a man who's promising man things. He is God. And so we can be sure and confident in what he promises. When he promises to save us from our sin, we can have confidence that he will do that because he's doing it as God. He's doing it with the full authority of the Lord, not with the authority of any man. And so we need not doubt whether Jesus is able to save us. We need not doubt as to whether his mission was a success or not. We need not doubt as to whether he will return to take us home to be with him. We can have full assurance in the gospel and all of its promises because of the fact that he is not just the son of David, because there were lots of people that were sons of David, but because he is the Lord of David. And so the one to whom David put his hope in, when David said of his son, the son will not come back to me, but I will go to him. You remember the son of Bathsheba that dies? He says, the child will not return to me, but I will go to him. The assurance that David had in that was that a Messiah would come, his Lord, and he would save us from death. And it's to that hope that you and I can look today.
It's to that hope that you and I can live our life in full assurance that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this glorious reminder that Jesus is the Lord. That his work was not driven by anyone except for yourself. And we pray that you'd help us to rest in the promises of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me for another day. Great to be together. Great to have another week in God's word. I'll see you back here next week for another week of devotions. God bless.